Good evening, everyone. So today, I will be discussing briefly about maintenance fluid. How do you select a maintenance fluid? How do you prescribe? What are the indications? What are the goals? And how does disease influence the choice of fluids? So coming straight to the topic. So whenever we're talking about a maintenance fluid, we need to remember that fluids so today we will be discussing these based on the recommendation by the American Academy of Pediatrics as well as the NICE guidelines published in 2015. So now whenever we write an IV fluid, we remember that IV fluids are life-saving, but IV fluids are also the drug causing the most number of adverse events. So every time we prescribe that, we need to remember that. And that is why the concept of fluid stewardship is there. That is, when you're prescribing a drug, uh, uh, IV fluid, you need to write which fluid, that is, which drug, what is the dose, what is the volume you want to give, for how long do you want to give, and when do you plan to de-escalate. Do de-escalate, that means do stop or do decrease where as early as possible. So, coming to the topic proper, that is maintenance fluid, in practice, we may find 101 reason to prescribe a maintenance fluid. But every time we are prescribing a maintenance fluid, we need to remember that it provides only 20% of the required calories because most of the maintenance fluid, be it DNS, be it isolate, be, be it half DNS, all of them contains only 5% dextrose. A 5% dextrose means it is going to provide only 20% of the required calories. And also remember that maintenance fluids do not have proteins, vitamins, and important minerals. And also, whenever you're putting someone on an IV fluid, there is a risk of electrolyte imbalance. There is a risk of local extravasation. There is a risk of systemic septicemia. There is a risk of fluid overload. And also remember that whenever you keep someone in gut empty, that is, we are not giving any feed enterally, there is always a risk of bacterial translocation because enterocytes are one part of the organ which takes a local nutrition. And whenever there is nothing locally, there is always the uh, it always there's a chance of atrophy. The cilia gets damaged. There are small ulcers getting formed, and gut is not a sterile zone. So the bacteria present in the gut may go for a translocation, leading on contributing again to a sepsis. So as far as possible, do not keep your gut empty and use the gut whenever it is available. So with that, there are reasons sometimes when we want to write a maintenance fluid. So what is the goal? What are the goals when you're prescribing your fluid? What is your aim? Of course, our aim is to prevent dehydration, prevent electrolyte imbalance, prevent protein breakdown, and prevent ketoacidosis. Yes, you can prevent dehydration, but electrolyte imbalance, major electrolyte imbalance may be prevented. But remember, improper prescription of a maintenance fluid may contribute to an electrolyte imbalance. Similarly, whenever you're putting someone on a maintenance fluid, he's going to lose 0.5 to 1% weight daily. So protein breakdown does happen when you put someone on a maintenance fluid. Yes, the amount of calories that are being provided in the maintenance fluid does prevent ketoacidosis. So now you know there are four important goals, but in fact, all these goals are not completely achieved by the present system of prescribing a maintenance fluid. Now, which fluid do you want to use? Traditionally, we have been using isolate P. Now, why were we using isolate P? Because it had a sodium content which was similar to breast milk. But subsequently, we found that when hypotonic fluid like isolate P is used, there is a great high incidence of hyponatremia. When you're using an isotonic fluid, the incidence may be, say, less than 10%. And when you're using a hypotonic fluid, the incidence may be more than 50%. So that is why isolate P is no more routinely prescribed as a maintenance fluid. Now, there are situations where you may prescribe a half DNS, especially for small babies, especially those with a little failure to thrive or less than 5 kg. But this is also not routinely recommended. What is routinely recommended, in fact, is a fluid like DNS or plasma light. -like. That means the recommendation is use an isotonic fluid which has a sodium between 131 to 154 milliequivalents per liter. This is the recommendation is for babies from 28 days to 18 years of age. 131 means something similar to ringer lactate. 154 means something similar to normal saline. So something between these two. 
and ideally a maintenance fluid should contain 5% dextrose. But in certain situations, like you're prescribing a maintenance fluid for a child who has undergone a, a, a neurosurgical procedure, a brain tumor surgery, or someone in an operative theater, there is high chance of the patient being there in hyperglycemia, and which may be deleterious. So sometimes the initial fluid may be dextrose-free solution, but subsequently when you prescribe a routine maintenance, you definitely require 5% dextrose. Now, what about potassium chloride? It is a very important electrolyte which needs to be added to all maintenance fluid, provided your kidneys are normal, provided you're not having a risk for hyperkalemia. So if you don't have a risk for hyperkalemia, then definitely potassium is needed. So the classical maintenance fluid would be a DNS with KCL, that is 500 ml DNS containing 5 ml of KCL, which would give you 20 milliequivalents per liter of KCL. And another preferred fluid nowadays is plasma light, which comes with and without dextrose. Plasma light with dextrose would be preferred. Now, what is the advantage of using plasma light? Whenever you're using a normal saline containing fluid, remember, normal saline has sodium of 154, but it also has chloride of 154. Your normal body chloride would be around 900. It's never 154. So that is pretty high. Whereas when you're using a fluid like plasma light, the sodium content, uh, the chloride content is only 98. So what happens when you're using a fluid with a high chloride? When you're using a fluid with a high chloride for a long time, you can have hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. And hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis causes efferent arteriolar constriction, which can cause decrease in renal blood flow and decreased GFR. So this phenomenon is especially observed when you're using normal saline for large volume resuscitation. It's not that much observed when you're using for maintenance. But if you're using maintenance for a long period of time or in special situations where you're using a one and a half time maintenance, say in some kinds of poisoning or when you are, uh, or in some situations where you want the urine to excrete the toxin or the metabolite more. For example, a myoglobinuria conditions where you may be sometimes prescribing one and a half times normal saline. So in those situations, you can have a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. So now, are these guidelines applicable to all? No, there are a subset of populations where isotonic fluid is not recommended, especially for those with malnutrition, whether it is marasmus or sugar, because these subgroup of children are also having biochemical malnutrition, which means that the sodium potassium ATPase is not working. They have a high total body sodium. They cannot tolerate sodium and they find it very difficult to excrete sodium. So in this subgroup of patients, again, remember your maintenance fluid uh, is going to provide only 20% calories. So no child with malnutrition can come out of malnutrition with the prescription of a maintenance fluid. They require enteral feeds to really come out of it. And also remember, that if there is an indication, if there is a GI contraindication and you need to prescribe a maintenance fluid for a child with severe malnutrition, then the maintenance fluid would be isolite P. So now coming to, you've selected the fluid, how much to take? Classically, we were using the holiday cigar method, but this is no more use. The reason is you don't want to prescribe maintenance fluid for 24 hours. Instead, you want to prescribe a maintenance fluid for as short duration as possible. It is mandatory that at least six hourly you reassess the child and decide how much fluid to be given. So classically, uh, you would require the 4 to one rule. That is what we commonly use now. That is for the first 10 kg, it is 4 ml per kg per hour. For the next 10 kg, you would add 2 ml per kg per hour. And any weight about 20 kg, it would be 60 ml plus 1 ml per kg per hour. That means a 20 kg child would require 60 ml per hour. So this is how you are expected to write an hourly prescription and not a daily prescription. So now how much to write? So this is the calculation that we use. That is 4 to 1 for the hourly prescription. But if you're right, but whenever you're writing a maintenance fluid, especially for a longer duration of period, remember that in a critically ill child, you cannot write the full maintenance. Because what is the goal of writing a fluid? The goal of writing a fluid is to replenish the anticipated loss from basal metabolism. So when your child is ill and when your child is in your ICU, the anticipated loss from basal metabolism is considerably less. 
Why is it so? A normal person excretes 35% of the fluid through the skin and the lungs and 60% comes out through the urine. The 5% will be through the stools and other basal metabolic needs. Now we need to understand that when you are in an ICU in a controlled environment, the evaporative skin loss of fluid is less. When you are critically ill and are provided with a humidified oxygen in the form of an HFNC or an NIV or an invasive ventilation, the water lost through your breath is also less. Similarly, you have to remember that when you are having an acute illness, say a painful condition, a meningitis or a bronchiolitis, these are conditions which are associated with non-osmotic antidiuretic hormone secretion. That means this makes that fluid gets retained in your body. You might have observed that in your ICU, even when you're writing a maintenance fluid, the next day the child looks puffy. That is why every time you write a maintenance fluid for a critically ill child, please write only two-third maintenance. It can be anywhere between 50 to 80% of the maintenance. They are not blanket rules. You start with that and then periodically assess your child and decide whether you want to increase the fluid or whether you want to decrease the fluid. Looking at the urea would give you a good indicator of what is happening to your intravascular volume in most instances. Now, we also need to remember that every time you're prescribing a fluid of more than 50% maintenance, then daily you have to check blood glucose, electrolytes, renal function test. It is mandatory. 12 hourly, you have to look at the fluid balance. So how is the intake? How is the output? Which is the fluid overload percentage? And 24 hourly also, you need to have a consolidated fluid overload calculation. And for small children, it is very important to look for daily weight because that is the best way to assess the hydration status for a small baby. Because sometimes it's very difficult to know whether you have adequately hydrated, especially say a child with malnutrition, it's very difficult to say, whether the child is, the skin turgor is lost because of marasmus or it is lost because the child is dehydrated. So in these situations, the weight would definitely help. So in fact, ideally, all children who are on maintenance fluid, it is better to start a daily weight. Another important thing you need to understand is that, in fact, in many conditions, for example, a child with uh, cirrhosis, a child with acute liver failure, a child with CCF. These are all conditions which are again prone for hyponatremia. So in these situations also, you want an isotonic fluid, but any child with any illness, you would definitely monitor the electrolytes more frequently and arrange your and adjust your fluid sodium concentration and potassium concentration depending on the results that you get. So if the child is admitted with an electrolyte imbalance, then daily once checking electrolytes is not enough. If you're managing a hyponatremia or hypernatremia, you would require to check the sodium minimum four to six hourly. If your child is acutely ill with a major organ dysfunction, then the electrolytes need to be checked 12 hourly. If it is a maintenance fluid only for a GI contraindications, then daily one electrolyte would be enough. So this is also important to understand. Now, what about children with shock? This is a small subset of patients where you do start maintenance fluid and you avoid enteral feeds at the time of admission. That is because we all know whenever you are in shock, your splanchnic circulation is compromised. And when your splanchnic circulation is compromised, at that time, if you are going to give feed, then there is a chance of bubble ischemia. There is a chance of uh, feed intolerance also. So that is why in case of shock, we usually start a maintenance fluid. Again, a fluid with 5% dextrose. And when we find that, two numbers of glucose is above 180, you would like to start an insulin infusion rather than stopping the 5% dextrose in most instances. Then once the child's shock is corrected, we will definitely start enteral feed. When we say that once the shock is corrected, we do not mean that you are going to start fluid only after the inotrope is stopped. It means that with inotrope, once your shock correction goals are attained, that is you, you are getting urine output, your heart rate has come down, your perfusion is good, then while the child is on inotrope itself, you would start a maintenance fluid. Not maintenance fluid, you would start enteral feeds. But only thing is here, you would start a stepwise escalation to see that the child is tolerated. So once again, reiterating, whenever you have a gut 
please use enteral phase. Even if the child is sick, if child is not fit to take orally, just put an NG tube and start feeding through the nasogastric tube. The baby will be more comfortable. The baby would be more, uh, baby will not lose weight and would come out of the um, disease more healthy. So it is important to use the gut whenever it is available.